As the Civil War entered its fourth and last year in April 1864, a sense of optimism prevailed in the Union Army, if not necessarily among the civilian population, who in addition to facing their everyday hardships were tired of worrying about the war. Mary Richards Cummings wrote her sister Emmeline from Mound City, Illinois on March 10, 1864. It is dreadful sickly down here and a great many deaths. There was a corpse taken out of one house near here last Thursday. A young woman and her sister about 10 years old died with the measles. Ann Cole died last Monday. I went out in the country with them to bury her. It gives you a good idea of the hardships of life at that time. I mean, it was in the spring, there was a lot of sickness around her, there was a death every day. With the soldiers, they had pretty well committed by that time. They had a job to finish and they wanted to finish it. But for the people back home, it had been so long. So many people had been lost by that time. Because we're talking by the end of war, almost 4,000 people from Logan's 9th Congressional District. And I mean, that hits these small communities. So I, I think the basic difference was is that the civilian population was probably more ready to make peace than the soldiers were. On March 9th, President Lincoln appointed Ulysses S. Grant as General of the Army. The newly promoted Grant and his most trusted subordinate, Major General William T. Sherman, met to plan a strategy for ending the war. Grant would remain in the East and focus on destroying General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, and Sherman would command Union forces in the West. The two generals planned to attack the Confederate forces simultaneously, thus preventing their enemy from shifting troops from one theater to aid another. The men from Logan's district would fight in the Southern War, the West in the war in the West, as opposed to the war in the East. So they were coming across the southern part of the Confederacy. Grant was coming down from the north, working into Virginia. The war's fourth year found the 81st Illinois Infantry, every one of its volunteers resided in Logan's old 9th Congressional District, a month into the Red River Campaign to capture Shreveport, Louisiana. Planned by Union General-in-Chief Henry W. Halleck, it began only a day after Grant's appointment and was a diversion from Grant's plan. This Union failure cost the lives of three men from Southern Illinois. Sherman's Atlanta campaign began on May 5th near Chattanooga, Tennessee. He planned the campaign to destroy the Confederate Army of Tennessee and seize Atlanta, the strategic backdoor to the Confederate States, one of the South's most productive arsenals and a critical transportation hub. Before the end of May, Sherman's forces had faced the Confederates at the battles of Resaca, Adairsville, New Hope Church, Dallas, and Pickett's Mill. Families on the home front followed the war in newspapers, but seemed to learn only enough to worry them. Nancy Mann wrote her husband John, a member of the 5th Illinois Cavalry, on May 24, 1864. The people here are waiting with great anxiety to hear of the success of our forces in their movements this summer. You soldiers cannot know the suspense, hope, fear, dread, and anxiety we home folks have regarding the safety of our friends. I know that God rules our nation, and whatever he brings to pass is right. Yet I cannot avoid this fear for the safety of friends. I know that if I should live to see peace restored to our country again, I shall know how to appreciate it. As Sherman's supply lines lengthened, he worried that Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest might move his Confederate cavalry from northern Mississippi into Middle Tennessee and destroy them. Late May, Sherman ordered General Samuel D. Sturgis, located in Memphis, into northern Mississippi with 8,500 men. 
Sturgis was to keep Forrest occupied and, if possible, destroy his almost 3,500-man cavalry force. The elements of the two armies first met at 945 on the morning of June 10, 1864. Almost five hours later, Captain Edmund Newsom, Company B, 81st Illinois, and his regiment enter into combat. At 3 p.m. while resting, the order came to march fast, as our cavalry were engaged with the enemy. We marched rapidly, the sun poured down with overpowering heat. This continued for three or four miles, and several men died at sunstroke. I dropped behind, being overcome, but after a time, I overtook the regiment. They were ordered to double quick and were soon out of my sight. I followed as fast as I could. I knew the battle was near. Soon, shot and shells flew thickly around me. I went down the road and met one of my men, sent back to take care of the haversacks, blankets, and etc. He showed me the way to the regiment. I found a regiment in line of battle in a small ravine. Soon the enemy commenced to fire on us. It continued for some time. We were ordered to fall back where we had some severe fighting. Our men stood up to it without any protection whatever and poured volley after volley into the enemy until our ammunition was nearly exhausted. Bullets began to come from nearly every point of the compass. Colonel Rogers ordered us to fall back again. Colonel Rogers asked, boys, can you run any? Not any, we are all tired, they replied. Nevertheless, when he commanded double quick, they tried. When Sturgis ordered the retreat at Bryce's Crossroads, it turned into a rout. Members of the 55th and 59th U.S. Colored Troops and Battery K, 2nd U.S. Colored Light Artillery, slowed the Confederate advance and covered the white soldiers' retreat. The story of their courage appeared in newspapers across the North. The New York Daily Tribune, however, minimized the significance of their actions because of the racist belief that blacks were not capable of being legitimate soldiers. The Battle of Bryce's Crossroads, a spectacular victory for the Confederates, ended Sturgis's Civil War military career. Forrest lost only 96 men killed and 396 wounded. Union forces lost 223 killed, 394 wounded, and 1,623 captured. Captain Newsom and some of his men avoided capture for almost three days. Monday, June 13, 1864. As soon as it was light, I awoke and looked at my sleeping companions. I was just about to awake them when I was startled by a voice saying, I know you're in there. And another voice asked, Is there more than one of them? By this time, we were all wide awake. I motioned to them to be quiet. The voice spoke again, Now come out and surrender, and you shall be treated as prisoners of war, but if you don't, I will shoot you like a dog. I called out, We surrender. He was surprised to find so many of us. Why, here's a whole nest of Yankees, he said to his men. And here's an officer, too. He conducted us to a picket post and robbed us of everything that was valuable. He conducted us to his lieutenant and gave us a small portion of bread and meat, for we were very hungry. We wrote letters to our folks at home, which the lieutenant promised to send to Memphis. They continued to bring others in until we were numerous. The greatest fear of captured black soldiers was being killed. Newsom talks about some African-American soldiers being captured and then taken off into the woods and he heard shots and they did not return. And I think he made the assumption, he didn't say that they were killed, but he made the assumption they were killed. So that we, we have two individuals, Newsom and Henry Guy, that would end up living in Jackson County after the war. Fought at the same battle, probably never saw each other there. Until 1863, most POWs were exchanged, but this system broke down and forced the construction of both Union and Confederate POW camps. Andersonville Prison was the most notorious. 
Located in Georgia, Andersonville Prison was designed to hold 10,000 prisoners, but at one point held more than 32,000. Imprisoned Union soldiers had little shelter, few rations, and only contaminated water to drink. Of the 45,000 prisoners who entered Andersonville, 12,920 died, primarily from scurvy, diarrhea, and dysentery. On average, 30 men died every day. Sergeant Major Robert H. Kellogg, 16th Regiment Connecticut Volunteers, described his entry as a prisoner into the prison camp May 2, 1864. As we entered the place, a spectacle met our eyes that almost froze our blood with horror and made our hearts fail within us. Before us were forms that had once been active and erect, now nothing but mere walking skeletons covered with filth and vermin? Can this be hell? In the center of the hole was a swamp occupying about three or four acres of the narrowed limits, and a part of this marshy place had been used by the prisoners as a sink. An excrement covered the ground, the scent arising from which was suffocating. Before war's end, Egypt would lose at least 107 men at Andersonville, 28 captured at Bryce's Crossroads. The first, Samuel T. Steins of Wayne County, died May 3, 1864 of chronic diarrhea and was buried in grave number 855. The last, Charles Gerlach of Randolph County, died March 20, 1865 of unlisted causes and was buried in grave number 12,801. Captain Henry Wurz, commander of Andersonville Prison, was later found guilty of war crimes and hanged. Sherman's army started seeing action in and around Marietta, Georgia at about the same time Sturgis was near Bryce's Crossroads. In June, Union troops fought engagements at Pine Mountain, Gilgal Church, Kolb's Farm, and Kennesaw Mountain. Sherman's army finally forced a complete Confederate's withdrawal on July 3rd. Early in July, the 5th Illinois Commissary, John Mann, considered the war's end near enough to ponder what occupation he would follow when he returned home. His wife, Nancy, answered his letter with her advice on July 16th. You speak of supporting yourself and family when you return home, but law would be the last thing I would advise. It would only be a source of vexation and perhaps starvation. I only worry about the uncertainty of you getting home at all. When you get here, there will be enough time to look ahead. I have lived 35 years and have seen many people die, but I have not yet seen one starve to death. Nancy's next letter to her husband would not be so light. In it, she tells of the death of her brother, Captain Harvey Clendenin, Company A, 80th Illinois Infantry. We this morning received a letter informing us of my brother Harvey's death at Marietta, Georgia on the 19th of July. He was wounded on July 4th. The 80th Infantry had been ordered to take the enemy's breastworks. They had to make a charge over an open field nine or ten hundred yards in width. They took the works and then had to stop under the fire of the enemy to throw up defenses. This was when Harvey was struck in the left shoulder with a piece of shell. He was sent to the field hospital at Marietta where he died. Alas, he will return to us no more. The realities of war have come home to us. May God protect his widow and orphan children. The fighting to take Atlanta continued in July with battles at Pace's Ferry and Peachtree Creek. On July 21, 1864, Confederate General John Bell Hood began a vicious assault on Major General James B. McPherson's Army of the Tennessee. The next day, McPherson was killed, and his command fell to Egypt's Major General John A. Logan. And he's given credit for having turned the battle. 
Logan galloped from position to position, rallying his boys and barking orders to his generals. They rallied behind him yelling, Black Jack, Black Jack, Black Jack, as he yelled McPherson in revenge and turned what would have been a Union loss into a victory. That day was a grand victory for Logan, and every soldier thinks of him as he looked on that occasion when, obedient to his electric voice, changed from disorganized forces to a victorious army. This made Logan the only political or volunteer general to command an army in the field in the Civil War. General Grant's siege of Petersburg was already two months old as Sherman began his siege of Atlanta. On July 30th, the Union, in an attempt to take Petersburg, detonated a mine, creating a crater 170 feet long, 100 feet wide, and 30 feet deep. The 29th U.S. Colored Troops, raised in Illinois, charged into this crater where they were mauled by musket and artillery fire. Nine men from the Shawneetown area fought at the crater. All survived. The siege of Petersburg lasted another eight months. Grant called the Battle of the Crater the saddest affair I have witnessed in the war. As August began, the presidential election was just five months away, and the battle for Atlanta was still raging. Republicans joined war Democrats to establish the National Union Party. Its convention met in Philadelphia in mid-August and nominated Republican Abraham Lincoln for a second term as president and war Democrat Andrew Johnson of Tennessee for vice president. The Peace Democrats met at the end of the month in Chicago, established their platform as peace at any cost, and nominated former Union General George McClellan for president. Their convention ended just two days before Atlanta surrendered. This election would see voters casting their ballots not just for a candidate, but also for the fate of the Union. The siege of Atlanta included five major battles. The first of these was the Battle of Ezra Church on July 28th, and the last, the Battle of Jonesboro on September 1st. That same day, the Confederate troops pulled out of Atlanta. Before leaving, they destroyed supply depots and burned 81 loaded ammunition cars to prevent them from falling into Union hands. Atlanta citizens surrendered the city on September 2nd. The next day, General Sherman telegraphed President Lincoln, Atlanta is ours and fairly won. Despite the boosts the capture of Atlanta provided Lincoln, he remained concerned that he would not win re-election. Because of this, he arranged with Grant for Logan to return to Illinois on a 20-day leave to campaign for him. Logan arrived in Carbondale, where he kicked off his campaigning on October 1st. October found Nancy Mann worried about her husband's health, the death of her brother having exacerbated her fear that her husband would not return. She wrote him on October 12th, first stating that if his regiment had a good and wise surgeon, he would send you to a more healthy place. We had looked for you home until we was in despair. Every night I would set the room in order, put the lamp and matches convenient to strike a light when you came, have got up every time a boat landed in the night and listened to hear you come up the street. One night, I thought that I heard you cough down opposite the grocery. I strained my eyes to the full strength, looking through the dark to see you turn off the street up to the gate. But you didn't come. Then I blamed my imagination with being deceitful. The little girls always tell me to be sure to wake them up if Pa comes home. Nancy's letter also informed him that her brother Harvey's saber and other things he had in the army had arrived home, and that it is sad to know that he will never be with us here again. Nancy's story had a happy ending. 
John was discharged three days after her letter was written, and he returned home to Randolph County, where he later became a lawyer. Nancy and John celebrated their 55th wedding anniversary before his death in 1908. John Logan met with other Illinois Republicans, who laid out a series of 16 speeches for him to give. His leave was extended to allow for this, and he remained in Illinois until after the election. Logan's efforts were so successful, and Lincoln even carried Egypt, that newly elected Republican Governor Richard Oglesby thanked him for his cooperation and support, stating that his work would never be forgotten nor cease to be honored by all Illinois. Egypt voted four to one against Lincoln in 1860. 20, he got, Lincoln got 20% of the vote and Logan turned it around by the election of 1864 because Lincoln did not want to lose his home state. An estimated 78% of Union soldiers cast their ballots in favor of Lincoln. McClellan took just three states, Kentucky, Delaware, and his home state of New Jersey. As a result of his leave, Logan did not take part in Sherman's march to the sea, which began with Sherman's departure from Atlanta on November 15th and ended with the fall of Savannah, Georgia on December 21st. On the city's surrender, Sherman telegraphed President Lincoln, I beg to present you as a Christmas gift the city of Savannah. Sherman's armies marched across Georgia, covering 285 miles in 36 days and fighting five battles. Along the way, they destroyed military targets as well as industry, infrastructure, and civilian property. Sherman's decision to operate deep within enemy territory and without supply lines is considered revolutionary in the annals of war. His scorched earth policies are still reviled by many Southerners to this day. Men from Egypt served in 11 of the 28 Illinois regiments. Three of these regiments, the 31st, 48th, and 56th, were raised almost exclusively in Logan's congressional district. It is amazing that only five men from Southern Illinois lost their lives in this campaign. As Sherman's march to the sea began, men from Southern Illinois were also fighting in the Franklin-Nashville campaign. The purpose of this campaign was to protect lines of communication from Confederate General John Bell Hood's assaults. It culminated on December 15th through the 16th when General George H. Thomas's forces routed Hood at the Battle of Nashville. Hood's Army of Tennessee retreated to Tupelo, Mississippi. He soon resigned his commission and the Army of Tennessee became an ineffective fighting force. January 1st, 1865 found Sherman in Savannah preparing for his advance into the Carolinas. Logan, back from Illinois, was again in command of the 15th Corps, Army of the Tennessee. Almost a month later, on February 3rd, Sherman's army fought the Battle of Rivers Bridge, South Carolina, where his men waded through a swamp to flank the Confederates blocking his advance. His forces captured South Carolina's capital, Columbia, two weeks later. Much of the city was burned. Historians still debate the cause of the fires, blaming the victorious Union Army, the retreating Confederate forces, and or the weather. On February 27th, just 10 days after Columbia's fall, the enlistments of the original members of the 56th Illinois Infantry, most recruited in Massac, Pope, Gallatin, Saline, White, Hamilton, Franklin, Hardin, Williamson, and Wayne Counties, ended. 205 men chose not to re-enlist. There being no way to facilitate their mustering out, they were forced to remain with the regiment. Three weeks later, these men fought in the Battle of Bentonville, North Carolina. It was in this battle, fought March 19th through the 21st, that General Sherman soundly defeated Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston. This was the last major battle of the Carolinas campaign. The men who chose not to re-enlist were finally able to leave for home from Wilmington, North Carolina on March 29th aboard the SS General Lyon. Two days later, the Lyon encountered a storm off Cape Hatteras, caught fire, and sank. We're carrying coal oil, and that coal oil leaked out of the barrels and hit the boiler, set the ship on fire. And the Lyon lost 600 people plus, 
crew passengers. But on that ship, of the 205 men from the 56th Illinois Infantry, only five survived. And thus, states the 56th Infantry's regimental history, on March 31st, 1865, 200 men, as noble and brave as any who fought for the Union, perished. The Lyon disaster was the worst one-day loss of life for Southern Illinois in the Civil War. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia. That same day, Union forces captured Fort Blakely, forcing the surrender of Mobile. Not only was Fort Blakely the last major battle of the Civil War, it was also Private Samuel Crawshaw's Company B, 81st Illinois Infantry's last battle. It would be August, however, before he was back in Jackson County, Illinois, with his family. John Wilkes Booth shot President Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater five days later. Soldiers carried him across the street to the Peterson family's boarding house. He died there at 7.22 a.m. on April 15, 1865. Among those present at Lincoln's death was Illinois Adjutant General Isham Haney, a fellow Egyptian and friend of John A. Logan. The excitement baffles description. The horrors of last night have no parallel in memory or history. The Secretary of War was busy all night, preparing and sending dispatches, Surgeon General Barnes holding the President's arm, feeling his pulse, the Cabinet seated around and some standing, Governor Oglesby at the head of the bed, and myself near the door. The President lay with his feet to the west, his head to the east, insensible, in a comatose state, never spoke. Logan, commander of the 15th Corps, was in Raleigh, North Carolina when the news of President Lincoln's assassination reached the Army of the Tennessee. While most of the troops remained calm, a mob of about 2,000 soldiers vowed to avenge Lincoln's death. They took up torches and marched toward Raleigh, shouting and threatening to burn the city. Logan galloped up to the men and ordered them back to camp. When they ignored him, he threatened to order the artillery to rake them with canister. We don't know exactly what he said, but he probably told him the war was over, it was time to quit killing. But whatever he said, plus the cannon, these men did, the mob did break up and go back to the thing. And in, in 2006, Logan, because he did this, was placed in the Raleigh, North Carolina Hall of Fame. And this is a remarkable thing I think for two reasons. One is the fact that, the, the, that this Hall of Fame is for people from Raleigh, and two is the fact that he's a Union general. And he is probably the only Union general that has been put in any Confederate States Hall of Fame. On April 26th, Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston surrendered to General William T. Sherman. For all practical purposes, the Civil War was ended. That news must have elated Williamson County's Captain Solomon C. Mooningham, Company C, 31st Illinois Infantry. He had enlisted at Logan's call to arms in Marion's Courthouse Square in August 1861. In the three years and seven months that followed, he fought in 14 battles and 25 skirmishes and marched a total of 2,076 miles. While the war was over, he was not mustered out until July 19, 1865 in Louisville, Kentucky by his old colonel, now commander of the Army of the Tennessee, Major General John A. Logan. The North celebrated its victory with the Grand Review, a great two-day parade down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. on May 23rd and 24th, 1865. The Army of the West, which contained Egypt's regiments, marched on the second day. Captain Edmund Newsom, like most Union soldiers, did not get a grand review. After his release as a POW, he was sent to Benton Barracks, Missouri, where he remained until the war's end. His journey home began on May 16, 1865. I left my soldier's life at 4 p.m. When I reached the ferry, the boat waited. I was impatient and wanted to join my companions, for I could see across the river that the train had not yet gone but the ferry boat waited. 
I saw the train pull out and leave, then I knew that I should have to go home alone. After a while, the ferry boat moved over the river. As soon as I landed, I asked when another train would leave and was informed at 6 p.m. I then slept on the bench until awakened by passengers buying tickets. The train arrived at Odin at midnight and I bought a ticket on the Illinois Central, surprised to find my companions and fellow prisoners waiting to make a connection. Soon the train arrived and we, who had been so long together in the Army and had suffered together as prisoners, bid each other farewell as one after another left us at the several stations along the road until I was left alone. I arrived home at 3 a.m., no longer a soldier, but a private citizen once again, and I enjoyed the blessings of home with due appreciation of the comforts thereof. The soldier's dream was realized. It would be well into 1866 before all of Egypt's Union volunteers would realize this dream. By December 31, 1863, Logan's old 9th Congressional District had sent 13,279 volunteers to the Union Army, or 42% of the district's eligible men. The state of Illinois sent, on average, only 29%. This number impressed General Grant, and he included the fact in his memoirs. General Logan went to his part of the state to raise troops. The very men who at first made it necessary to guard the roads in southern Illinois became the defenders of the Union. His district, which had promised at first to give much trouble to the government, filled every call made upon without resorting to the draft. There was no call made when there was not more volunteers that were asked for. Logan's Congressional District stands credited at the War Department today with furnishing more men for the Army than it was called on to supply. Over 3,700 of these soldiers, a little more than one in four, did not return home. And there is no count of the men who returned home physically and mentally broken. Most of the men who fought in the Union Army felt great pride in what they had done. Whether that pride was saving the Union, or ending slavery, or both, is still a subject that needs more study. And they felt very strongly that what they had done was writing the course of history. America is the city on the, what, the shining city on the hill. That city could not exist if it were broken up. It would destroy God's plan for America, and it ridded the nation of the scourge of slavery. I mean, they felt very, very strongly about this. There were two individuals who are known to have changed their attitudes towards African Americans, slavery and the South. They were proud of what they had to do to end the scourge of slavery in a nation founded on the concept that all men are created equal. One was Captain John P. Reese, who in March 1863 wrote his wife from Lake Providence, Louisiana. I think this is the nigger's paradise. They have plenty to eat and enough to wear, and their quarters are better than the houses of poor people in the south part of Illinois. The government will inflict an irreparable injury upon the darky here if it frees them and take them north. Your husband until death, John P. Rees. The war changed Reese in one of his last letters home, written from Montgomery, Alabama on May 18, 1865. He wrote his wife, Dear Tissa, on last Sunday morning, we witnessed a Negro woman and one Negro man came to the city with their ears cut off close to their heads and the flesh cut from the sides of their heads, leaving the skull naked in some places. The weather was warm and they had been some days without medical treatment. The rebels done the deed without provocation. I am glad we had this war, for such a state of society as existed in the South is a disgrace to Republican government. They think it mere pastime to shoot a Negro, but we will teach them a lesson yet. 
Before they are much older, I remain as ever your John. The war also changed John A. Logan, who, thanks to the vivid illustrations in Harper's Weekly and Leslie's Illustrated, had received national recognition and hero status. The once pro-slavery, abolitionist-loathing Democrat, while still in uniform, supported the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery in a two-and-a-half-hour speech in Louisville, Kentucky. He asked his audience, how under heaven's name can anyone desire such a cause of sorrow and suffering and hate be perpetuated in his country? He then implored them to strike at and deal slavery a death blow. A year later, Logan championed the 14th Amendment, granting citizenship to America's formerly enslaved peoples. In a July 4th speech to 25,000 Union veterans in Salem, Illinois, Logan declared, There is no government on earth but ought to make every man a citizen by the laws and by the flag, wherever he may be. A woman is a citizen. A child is a citizen and so ought a black man. Any Christian people on top of God's earth that would not give this protection of the law to every human being that had life breathed into him by our Father commits a great sin and sinks into oblivion. You ask me how I became such a great advocate of universal citizenship. I have had my prejudices just as other men but when I marched on southern soil, I looked for friends. But the white man was a traitor, the sympathizer with rebellion. But the poor colored man, bowed down by the chains of slavery, would tell you where the rebel forces lay and how you might attack. Though his skin was black, I could trust him sooner than the white traitor. Hence, I want him to have the protection of the law. Logan was quick to let his Salem audience know that his support of citizenship for blacks did not include the right to vote. He pointed out that the power to do this lay with the individual states, noting that women were citizens but could not vote. It would take a year for his political philosophy to evolve to support the right to vote and hold office for the nation's newest citizens. In a speech in late September 1867 in Cleveland, Ohio, Logan stated that he favored the election of colored men to Congress and intimated that a colored president would not be much amiss. The man who had begun his political career as rabidly pro-slavery ended it as a champion of civil rights, of whom Frederick Douglass said in an 1884 endorsement for the Republican vice presidential candidate. But what of John A. Logan? I will tell you. If there is any statesman on this continent, now in public life, to whose courage, justice, and fidelity I would more fully and unreservedly trust the cause of the colored people of this country or the cause of any other people. I do not know him. Since Charles Sumner and O.P. Morton, no man has been bolder and truer to the cause of the colored man and to the country than has John A. Logan. There is no nonsense about it. I endorse him to you with all my might mind and strength and without a single shadow of doubt.